Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing really well. I, my name is Nikki Woodford, and in this session of learning more learning together, we're going to take a look at some math instructional strategies using Google applications. Now, before we get started, you will notice that there is a shortened link here, and that link is to this series of slides. This link will stay live and active. So if at any point you want to come in and grab uh, some of the templates that I show you or the websites, by all means, you are welcome to come in and, and access them. In our time together, we're going to be exploring a number of different things. Now, just a couple of things to pass on. First of all, this is an intermediate session. One, for one reason, because I'm going to be showing you some additional skills, some additional features, and even some apps we may not have explored in the past. And so for that reason, it's not just a quick basic how-to. This we're taking it kind of one step up with some added features and some additional um, just kind of things to think about. The other reason is we're also talking pedagogy and good practice. And so any re any time that we're talking effective instruction, it's never just as simple as how do I do this. So for that reason, it's always it's also just another step up. Now in our time together, you'll notice that I've kind of split up the conversation into four different um, kind of topics. One is just some skills to know, some basic technology skills that if you don't already know these, then you may want to practice them because they're super helpful. Uh, two is we'll take a look at some instructional strategies so when we're delivering instruction, some things to consider. Three, we'll take a look at a couple of different activities, and we're going to take a look at three specific applications that you can use. And then lastly, we'll take a look, I will throw you some additional websites that, you, that might be helpful as you're delivering instruction for math. Now, this is a, clearly a session focused on math. However, you will notice that some of these strategies you'll be able to apply to other content areas. And uh, I would humbly suggest that this could work for all content or all grade levels uh, from primary all the way up to high school. Some of you may disagree with me, but I think there's at least something that, that at each level you'll be able to take away. Okay. Now, before we get started, I want to just start with a disclaimer. Okay. Let me clarify that I do not believe that by just throwing technology tools and strategies, um, that that will replace all of that problem solving work, all of that practice, all of that learning that still happens with a, with a pencil and paper. There is still need and room for that. Right? By no means am I suggesting that what we are taking a look at today is going to replace or negate that strategy and that work. Really what we're talking about is things to add and complement some of that work to really enhance the teaching and learning of math and numeracy, but not to not to replace. Okay. Now, you'll also see on your screen there are a number of Google applications. And that's largely because we're going to be talking about a few in this session. Um, and the ones that I'm going to highlight, again, Google Slides, it continues to be a favorite of mine and has so much potential for all content areas. But we're also going to take a look at Google Sheets and Math. So, and then, of course, there's the classic Google Drawings and Google Forms. So there is a variety that we're going to take a peek at. And without keeping you too long, then let's get started. So as I mentioned, we're going to start with some skills. And so I'm going to actually pop out of this series of slides so that I can show you better. The first is making sure that you know how to take a screenshot. So on your Windows device, if you press the function key in the print screen, it should open your snipping tool. So then you can take a screenshot of anything that you see on your screen. I actually have my snipping tool pinned to my taskbar on the bottom. And so that I can access that snipping tool anytime I need it. Uh, and that is super helpful, especially if you're giving instructions or you create something and then want to, want a copy of it, then you can take a screenshot and then you've got that image um, mapped up, if you will. Another option is taking a snapshot. 
And so this is possible in Google Slides, it's possible in Google Docs, and it's possible in Google Drive. Okay. And so the, the way to do this is to go insert image and then click on the camera tool. And so what it does is it opens up uh, the camera and another window. And so you can go ahead, hold up some hard copy work that has been done, and then use the camera to take a picture of it. Now, this is a really nice way to um, complement some of that hard copy, that paper and pencil work that is done. Uh, and so it doesn't have, not all of the work needs to be done using a keyboard, but in fact, it can still be done, but now you've got a digital record of it. Simple, but effective. And so I would just select the picture and click insert. The other thing is being able to change your background. So you can change a background in both Google Drive and Google Slides. Now, to note, when you want to change the background, the background does need to be a JPEG or an image file, or a JPEG or a PNG. Okay? Now, if you click on the link here, you'll be able to access um, a, a Google folder with already created templates. Uh, of different types of graph paper. Now, all you'll have to do is go into those if you want to use any of them, make a copy of that folder, then go into them and, and just kind of download it or save it as a JPEG. To do that in slides, it is simply go file, download, and then you can select what format you want it in. Okay, and so you can do the same in drawings as well. Now, if I want to change the background, I can do it in one of two ways. So the first way is I can click background or right click. I'm going to change the background and now I just go choose the image. So here's the image that I want. I'm going to click insert. Let it pull up and now click done. Now the nice thing about this is now if I try and click on it, it doesn't move. So it's not an image I can just click that um, is manipulated when I select it. It is static and in place. The other way that I can do this is I can actually edit the master. And by master, I mean, take a look at your layout slide. So you see how you have a variety of different layouts. Well, if you wanted to, you could add a layout that is simply graph paper. And so to do that, I'm going to, and this is helpful, especially if you're going to give something like this to students, um, this slide deck because then they can just go grab that particular slide as they're creating. So I'm going to go into slide, edit the master, and now here, here is a slide that I want to convert into um, this graph like image. And so I'm simply going to go insert image from drive because that's where I know it is and pull this one in. And so it now snaps it to the right size. I can rename it if I want. Uh, and then I'm just gonna click close and it saves it for me. And so now if I were to go into layout, I can see there is that custom graph layout and I can just grab it whenever I want. Okay, we're gonna pop back into kind of block the big screen as we keep going. So those are some of um, a couple of different tools to add to your toolbox. But now we're gonna take a look at a couple of different strategies. And so one of the first strategies has to do with providing instructions. In this particular season, I know that you are providing instructions, but I just wanna add a couple of reminders. So one, make sure that your instructions uh, for math, but for any content area, are super explicit. And so when you type them out and give directions and post them, that you very are super clear about what you want the students to do. If there is any room for interpretation or guesswork, it is a ultimately becomes a hoop that kids have to jump through. They have to try and make sense of what you are saying. And for those students where it is, it is. Uh, too much of a struggle to try and understand what's being asked of them, they will just give up and quit. And we don't want that. So and, and one additional thought to consider is don't just post your instructions um, by typing them out. 
but you may also want to include a video that shows them, a screencast that shows them what they need to do so that not only can they go back and read the instructions, but they can also go back and watch it as well. And so we've got that those multiple ways that students uh, can make sure that they understand what to do. Okay. All right. I'm going to be talking about collaborative slides extensively. This is one of my favorite strategies for a couple of reasons. One, as a teacher, you have really quick access into what students are doing and where students are at because you're all working in the same slide deck. The other reason I really like it is that the possibility for collaboration and from learning from each other is, is there is a lot of potential for that because students can do what they need to do in their own slide, but then kind of take a peek at what somebody else is doing. And that might encourage them to be like, oh, they're doing something different. I wonder if I need to do something different. Um, and so that there's great potential for both teaching and learning using collaborative slides. So quickly, to create a collaborative slide, all you are doing is creating a new Google slide where you might have a problem up in the first slide, some directions in the second slide, or vice versa. But you need both the problem and the directions. And then you just create a slide for each student. Put their name in it, or you could ask them to put their name in it. And, and then the work that each student needs to do to solve the problem and follow the instructions happens within that one slide. Now, just a note in Google Classroom, when you prepare to send this slide um, file to students, do not select make a copy for each kid. Instead, select students can edit, because then what you're doing is you're pulling all students into your slides. Okay? And so the possibility is that A, Again, as the teacher, you can see what each student is doing or has done, and it's all within one file. And two, students can see each other's work. And so from just a, like I said, when you're working together and learning from each other, there is some good possibilities here. Now, just a note, this works really well in a synchronous learning environment. It is perhaps a little trickier in asynchronous, but it can still be done. Okay, all right, so as we talk about another strategy, whoa, look at that, I changed my master. Whoop. So, um, and, and <laughs> oh no, I'm distracted. So another strategy is that you can take a collaborative slide and you can add one step up um, and have the students show their thinking. So if I show you a sample, let's get out of there. If I show you a sample, um, then here would be the directions. Here would be the problem that they need to solve. And here's where, again, here's the, what they need to copy. And so what I'd be asking them, okay, so solve your, solve the problem, take your screenshot, pop it into your slide. And then I actually, in the other textbooks, I want you to explain how you did it. So discuss the, the, the thinking, discuss the process here. Uh, and so again, we're not just solving the problem, but we're also attending to the process and the metacognition around it. Okay, let's get off of that one. All right, so another option, again, using collaborative slides is to do the math wrong. And you can do this in two ways. So you could give the students as the teacher, you could give them the problem and then solve it incorrectly. And then on each of the student slides, they need to identify your error and solve it correctly. Or the other option is you give the problem to the students and you ask the students, solve it wrong. And then once they've put in their incorrect solution, they can start going to other student slides and identify where's the error. What did they do incorrectly? And then identify it to and provide, a, insert a comment and identify what they did incorrectly. And so here's what I love about this is that not the students have to know the correct process, absolutely, because they need to know how to make it wrong. And they're going to be pretty crafty. How can I screw this up enough that the other kids won't catch this? 
And then when they take a look at somebody else's slide, again, they have to know the process, the correct process, how to solve it correctly, and to identify the error and then comment on it and articulate it. So I really like this one. There is a sample here that you can take a peek at if you like. Okay. One comment that we will often hear from students, we hear it in math, we hear it in language arts, we hear it in social. Let's be honest, we hear it. But when am I going to use math? Like if I go into real life, when am I going to use it? So show them. Show them with a picture when they are going to see it. And so you're starting um, and using images that students would see around them um, and incorporating them into your math instruction. And learning. So here's a scavenger hunt example. And this one, actually, if you open it up, um, the students have to go take pictures of these examples. But in, in another one, if I go here, is just pulling in images into Google Slides or Google Drawings or anything like that. So it can be as simple as, do you see symmetry? And we start talking symmetry with things like angles, right? And so you can introduce that concept here. On the flip side, we can take a look at estimation. So estimate the number of sheep. Come and then I, talk to me about the strategy that you used. So I might say, well, I see, you know, 10 sheep along the back. And maybe I'm going to say that maybe there are 12 kind of rows of sheep. And so that's my estimate is based on that. But you can also provide some really um, elevated um, images as well as you're taking a look at senior high level math and talking about Fibonacci sequence or things like that. And so just really pulling images in to make the math relatable to as soon as they leave your classroom, brick and mortar or not. Um, so just a reminder how to do that. You go insert, whether it's in Google Drawings or Slides, insert image and you can either pull it up from your computer you could take a picture with your camera load it to google drive you can go find it somewhere in the world of google you've got a number of options okay now so those are some instructional strategies some things to kind of incorporate and include now let's take a look at three different activities one has to do with pixel art so Pixel art is simply making images and art by coloring individual points. Okay? It's been around for some time. This is not a new concept. But students can create pixel art in Google Sheets. So I'll show you how to do it first. How do we set that up? And then we can take a look at some um, reasons why we might want to. So in Google Sheets, here we go. I'm just going to close this and go back to sheet one. Um, you can, this one is all set up for me. You can create art or images, like I said, by simply coloring individual squares. So I want that one red, I want that one orange, I want this one green. Uh, and so if you go through kind of this process, you can create anything you want. Trees, it could be a house, it could be um, a rainbow, like, or super complicated, right? Um, now, how do we do this? I'm going to create a new sheet right here. And so the first we, the first thing that we want to do is we want to resize the column. So I simply clicked on this top left corner box here to highlight all the cells. And now I'm just going to grab the uh, um, kind of the column of one and pull it over. And that's going to resize them all. OK. Now. I want to highlight them all again, and now I'm going to insert the formatting necessary. And so to do that, we're going to go into Format and select Conditional Formatting. Now, the thing that we want to make sure that we've got is that it always applies to all the cells. Now, here's the rule. If format the cells so that if the cell is equal to the number one, then the text color is going to be red and the fill color is going to be red. I'm done. Now I'm going to add another rule. I'll show you again. Again, it applies to all cells. If the cell is equal to the number four, then that color is going to be green. The text color is going to be green and the fill color is going to be green. So now let's check this out. 
If I type in the number one, it turns red. If I type in the number four, it turns green. So now I would just go ahead and add all the rules that I need to for all the colors that I want. Okay, pretty simple. So now let's take a look at, well, why? Why would we do this? Well, A, it allows students to be somewhat creative using numbers, which is good. But let's take a look at an example. So potentially, I can make a picture. So I made this picture a while back. Um, and then in this particular template, it asks me, OK, so estimate the number of red cells that you have and the number of orange cells and so on. And then in the next one, it asks me to calculate it. And then in the fourth one, it asks me to compare. OK, so this is an example of how we could use pixel art. We could use it as we are talking about estimating percentages, we could use it for area, we could use it for fractions, we could use it for, um, as we are talking about um, tens and hundreds and ones, right? So there's any number of ways that we can use this. And so if you notice here, there are also a number of templates that you can pull and use um, and some ideas to get you started with pixel art. So another um, activity that you could do with your kids is, is manipulatives. I've talked about these in other screencasts as well. But again, when you don't have the physical manipulatives in front of you, then you could consider digital manipulatives so the kids are still manipulating and demonstrating what they know without having to rely on text. And so, um, if you want a single manipulative activity, so it's just one activity, then design it in Google Drawings. It's the easiest. If you want multiple pages of manipulatives, then use Google Slides. Okay. Now, here are um, a couple of templates that you can use um, either just to get ideas or to use as a template. And here are a couple for Google Drawings. So I'm just going to pop in and show you this one. And these are just samples telling time. So it's just taking a moment to load. So here you can take a look at um, hundreds and tens and one blocks and kind of you can manipulate them over here. Um, just as a quick note, um, there was a moment in time, I won't tell you how long ago, where I was wondering, how do you do that so that when you pull the block away, there's another one underneath? And all you're doing is you are doing control copy and then Paste, 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 paste for however many you think you're going to need, and then stack them on top of each other. So they're just layered. That's right. um, but anyways, you will see that there are a number of different ideas here, even something as simple as like a, almost like a tangram you could do with something like that. Um, but I really like the potential of manipulatives because where you don't have the, um, the hard copy one, so to speak, you can create a digital one. And again, you're not relying on text, but it can still be a learning activity where, again, we just we don't need the text. I just need you to show me what you know. OK, and then the last activity I'm going to show you is my map. So we're likely all familiar with Google Maps, right? We use it regularly to figure out where we need to go. But did you know that you can actually create a map? So you can create your own map using Google Maps. So let me show you. The first one way that you can create your own Google Maps is to click New, More, and oh look, I can create my own map right there. And it's literally sitting just under Google Drawings. The other option is that you can open a new tab and you simply type um, mymaps.google.com and it will open up a new one. So I'm going to click on this one because I am here. And it is going to open an untitled map. So this is, again, very much like Google Maps. But now we get to create our own kind of customized layer over top of it. And it saves inside our Google Drive. OK, so I can go ahead and change the title of this. If there's a map activity, click save. You'll notice that there's a place to put directions in there. OK, so now I might want to get into a little bit closer. And now, here are my tools across the top. 
So I might want to add a marker. So I want a marker in Edmonton. And I could put some instructions here or information. You'll notice you can search images here as well. So there's different things you can do. Click save. And I also want to add another pin here at Saskatoon. I can't remember what that airport code is. And then I'm going to add one more here at Lethbridge. Okay. Now, because inherently in maps, you are dealing with units of measurement, kilometers. You could be working with time. You could be working with um, scale. Then there are lots of problems actually that you can create just using my maps okay now just to note you can add lines in here and you can also add directions in here so i might say that i want to add a line or a shape um so maybe i want to add uh this line here okay Oh, it disappeared. Let's do this. Um, and I want to travel this one. And click save. And, but I can also add directions and I can measure distances and areas. And it will just do that for me right here. And it tells me that this distance is 489, but it's along the line, right? So then you can even start talking about the the distance the way the bird flies versus the actual road itself okay so like i said inherently in maps there are are numbers that you can play with um that you don't need to come up with so you could create shapes you could say calculate the uh, shortest travel time the shortest distance if you had to go to edmonton leftbridge and saskatoon you are going on a holiday this summer, COVID style, right? And you want to explore these locations. Um, so you could do any number of problems in this way. I'm gonna add one thing more. Um, did you know that Google also has what's called flights.google.com? And so you can check on flight prices. Um, no, yes, there are any number of travel websites that will do this, but this one is super simple. So I want to go from Edmonton to Saskatoon. Oh, good. Let's try that again. I want to go to Saskatoon. And now here is the price. So you could say almost amazing race style. You have $1,000 for this leg of the race. You need to get to as many locations as possible. How many locations, which ones, and how much do you spend? Okay, so like I said, you can add one more um, measurement in there with money. Nonetheless, there you go. So there's my maps, another Google tool that perhaps we don't always consider. All right. As we come to a close, I'm just going to throw at you a couple additional sites and applications to consider. And here are three. The first is the Math Learning Center, and um, they have web based applications uh, that you can do a number of things with. So if I launch this website, it takes a moment to load. Um, then, yes, I agree. Thank you very much. Then I can use, there's clocks, there's number lines, there's number pieces, like number frames. Um, I can go into GeoBoard. This is um, a, a really good one to use as for many different levels. Um, and so you're just gonna open the web app. Don't need to go to the Chrome store. You're just gonna open the web app. And here you've got kind of this manipulative place that you can interact with. So I can pull this up and I can make shapes with it. And I can color it in. And now, remember, you also have your screenshot tool. So if I wanted to capture this, I just use my screenshot, and then I can pull this 
I've got a record of, of either what I've done or what the students have done. So this is a good one. Open Middle is a website that um, math, again, math specific, but it provides problems, kind of those real life problems. And the reason it's called the open middle is because there's a, a closed beginning, there's a problem at the beginning, and there's a closed end, and there's a solution. But the process to get to that solution is open. And so it can be solved in a number of ways. And so they are um, broken down by grade level. Now it is American. But if you go to open middle, I'm sure you'll be able to grab just a number of different problems that you could use based on different concepts. So once it loads, I'll show you that one. The other one is flippity. People have told me that this is really great for math. I, I see the potential. Certainly it could be good for um, statistics and probability, even if it's something as simple as the name picker or randomizer or things like that. Um, so I see that there's potential. I don't know that it would be my top pick, but could be really good, um, like I said, for, for statistics and probability for that strand. All right, um, I did mention I go back to open middle. So you'll notice, again, broken down by grade level and kind of concept. And so you can go in and grab any of these problems and use them with your students. All right. As always, I will always share um, some of the other great work that our colleagues are doing around the province. And I continue to go back to the work that Edmonton Catholic is doing with building their templates, their Google templates, and also the work that our Black Gold colleagues are doing building their um, Engaging Students website. Both of these websites um, will give you temp Google specific templates to use with your students. I'm going to show you Edmonton Catholic specifically because the templates are broken down by application and not by grade level. So if I go to classroom resources and templates, there we go, you will see that there are any number, I'll take a look at Google Drawings for example, that there are a number of different templates that all you have to do is open it. Go file, make a copy if it works for you. You can customize it as you like. There we go. Um, customize it as you like and then share it with your kiddos. So here's 10 frames, here's category sorters. Um, and so these are, use them. You guys go grab them and use them. They are there. Okay. And then I want to remind you again that all the learning together, um, whether they are screencasts or tutorial videos, they are all hosted here on the Sturgeon Public Schools Learning Together YouTube channel. Um, if there is anything that I've talked about, even if it's Google Drawings or Google Slides, feel free to come here. And there are, are short tutorials and there are also recorded webinars um, that will kind of take you through and help you with some additional learning and some additional uh, skills. Now, certainly if you have any questions along the way, if you require any sort of support or troubleshooting or let's do some collaborative planning, by all means, let me know. I am here to help and support as you need it, especially in this season. In the meantime, though, take care. Um, I hope you stay well and healthy, get some sunshine, and again, want to remind you, you are doing great, great work, and it is such a pleasure. Um, to both watch and partner with you. So, well done.